You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's going on? And welcome to the Straight to Video Podcast, episode 53, with me, your host, Rob Lane. On today's show, I am talking to Ken Stringfellow of The Poses. Now, I often talk about that time in the mid-90s when being a hard rock fan was pretty tough when it came to finding new bands that kind of fitted, I don't want to say the mould, but had that appeal to people like myself who liked great choruses and loud guitars. That said, whilst it was tough, it was also pretty exciting because it was kind of like anything goes and I would be open to listening to anything in the hope of finding a new band to love as I was just totally consumed with a love of music at that time. One band that ticked that box was The Poses and particularly their album Frosting on the Beater from 1993. It had all the great elements I was after, great pop hooks but with slightly angular guitars and melodies not as dark or aggressive as the crop of alternative bands that were taking over the world. And as Ken has mentioned in other interviews, The Poses acted as kind of an alternative to the alternative, which I think sums them up perfectly. Diving into a conversation with Ken can lead down many paths. The career of The Poses alone could take up many podcasts, and both he and his longtime bandmate and songwriting partner in The Poses, John Hour, have both performed as part of the band Big Star. In 1997, though, Ken was invited to be part of one of his biggest influences, R.E.M., and would tour with them for many years and also appear on several of their albums. During our chat, though, we dive right back to the beginning, and Ken is wonderfully open about his childhood and his time in school, both the good and the bad. We talk about how he and John would meet and strike up a friendship and songwriting force that is now in its fourth decade, and the incredible chain of events that led their band to get the attention of record labels and radio stations all over the U.S., We touch a little on how it was to join R.E.M. and we also talk about his upcoming live shows in Spain at the end of this month. Yes guys, actual real life live shows. If you want to keep up to date with Ken's solo work, the poses or find out more about this month's live gigs, then the best place would be to find Ken on Instagram or Twitter at Ken Stringfellow where there is a link to all his projects and ticket links or you can visit Ken Stringfellow Music on Facebook. Ken is also a very busy music producer, mixer and studio musician and is always on the lookout for new and interesting projects. So if that is of interest, then please hit him up at the same social media platforms. But for now, thanks for tuning in and let's dive right into my chat with Ken Stringfellow. So you've lived in France for some time now, right? Is it like the mid 2000s? Yeah. My wife and I got married in 2003. And um, just like the song, we got married in a fever, hotter than a pepper sprout. Uh, It was such a fast engagement to wedding uh, kind of whirlwind um, that, you know, we were in the midst of our lives. You know, I I lived in Seattle and I had a house and my career was based there and she lived in Paris and and her career was based there and she had her apartment. Uh, So it was kind of, it wasn't this long thing where you get together, then you live together in an apartment and then blah, 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 eventually you get married. We just boom, got married and then had to figure out how to put these two lives together on different continents. And um, I, you know, we, we, discussed both possibilities of her moving over to the States from me moving to France. And her career is a little more dependent upon being here than mine was. And I was, to be honest, kind of interested in trying something new. And to be fair, I mean, without making things sound like a 
too big of a deal. In Seattle, like it is kind of a small town feel for a city of half a million people. Uh, certainly the music scene is very insular and everybody knows each other. I mean, not insular in the way that people aren't welcome to it. I just mean that it's, you can meet everybody and if you're a mover and a shaker, you're going to meet everybody at the same club, basically. And, you know, I was really, really, really well known in Seattle. I mean, I'm not a world famous person, but in Seattle, I experienced something like fame, shall we say. You know, everybody, everywhere I went knew who I was. And it is certainly fun, you know, but I mean, it is real because it was happening, but it's not, it's not it's something that I particularly wanted to be in day in and day out. Um, it is after a little while, people don't act normal around you. That's the weirdest thing is you try your best to navigate the situation and everybody's, you, know, you make people nervous, which is just weird because I'm like really not an off-putting person. At least I don't think I am. I'm kind of a nervous person. Everything had a, a certain charge to it. It was fun to some degree, but it, it it's not the kind of thing I think personally, my personal view is, especially as a young person, uh, you'd have to be particularly self-aware to navigate that successfully in terms of like, you know, not developing some, so you say unpleasant traits. I mean, like it's the, that absolute power corrupts absolutely uh, is true down to the the scale of non-absolute power. I mean, if you're well-known or famous, you don't have absolute power. And we've certainly seen the tables turn on people in the last year as those people kind of were protected from scandal up to a certain point. That's completely different now. But still, you have a um, asymmetrical relationship with your environment, in a sense, and it gives you certain advantages um, that I think would be hard if you have any kind of weak temperament. It would be hard not to use that tool, in a sense. And it's too tempting. It's like the ring. And, you know, you can become rather corrupted by it. Anyway, I, I just felt like it would be, I'd kind of been there, done that, you know, and, I, and it was interesting to, to challenge myself because there's no challenges in Seattle. I didn't have to pay for anything. And I didn't have to open a door. If I walked up to a club, the door would open and I would be beckoned in, you know. So I'm more interested in learning and growing and developing. And I saw moving to France a place where, of course, you know, the Posies had a big hit in France and we were, we do have a, a name here, but it's not like Seattle. I mean, for the most part in Paris, like I went around my business with a completely indifferent population and, and that was absolutely fine. And, you know, all the other challenges of, of learning a new culture and a new language. And it's like a very healthy mindset to have, really, especially later on in your career. You could have easily just kind of cruised on for however long in Seattle, but it is kind of a healthy mindset to think, right, I'm going to flip things on its head and make this jump. Yeah, there is that thing. Um, and I'm not saying that France is the ditch, but um, there is that famous quote from Neil Young. You know, I, at one point in my career, I find myself in the middle of the road. So I decided to head for the ditch to make it more interesting, basically, and, and to go where the interesting stuff is happening. And I am kind of that way. I'm much more interested in, you know, exploring things on the periphery and things that aren't necessarily the easy route. And that's certainly true musically. And I think in my daily life, it's true too. Did it really help with your creativity, do you think? I think the whole thing of moving here and becoming a husband and becoming a parent, all of which I did right at the same time, did wonders for just my mental health in general. I can only imagine that benefited my creativity. You know, not not that I was in a position on the, in the macro sense in my career to coast on anything. I mean, the posies were popular. We sold quite a few records, but not the millions of records that would that would make anything like a sure thing. And I've even seen people who sell millions of records find themselves kind of abandoned in a sense without going too far down a tangent there. But anyway, I, I feel like that even so, like like going to a place that challenges you, it sets the mindset, I think. It both sets it and encapsulates it. I'm that kind of person that, that I would like to have a challenge and do something, you know, for the sake of exploration, in a sense, internal exploration of, you know, of, you know, to figure out who you are and keep pulling stuff out of you and not be unafraid to do so. And to go, you know, learn more things about the, the wider world it's not all about it's not all about you right we kind of jump straight in we're off and running yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. am i correct you were born in california originally but you kind of moved around a lot as a young kid yes yeah do you remember much of all the moving around before you settled in washington sure yeah yeah i think that is a major component or contributing factor to what i do in a sense you know i i think that i got so used to the idea of moving about that um the idea of something like moving to france on a whim, basically, on intuition. We can call it on intuition. Um, I knew it would be okay. I mean, with Dominique, uh, I knew that would be a good move. But the idea of, of doing something that 
radical? Isn't that intimidating? Because, you know, we had to do it all the time. I think just think in general, my, my wanderlust is attributable to this kind of peripatetic lifestyle that we had. I would say we moved every year or two up until I was like nine. Um, and this is everything to do with my, my father's line of work. My dad worked in television. He worked on the executive side selling, well, sales executive uh, selling ad time. So now and then he would get a better gig you know, at another station, you know, started at ABC in LA and then moved over to CBS while he was still in LA. And then when I came along, he was working for CBS and then, you know, would go to the New York station or the Chicago station or the Detroit station um, and, and be based there doing their thing. By the time my parents split up when I was nine years old, my dad moved over to television syndication, which is basically like relicensing existing properties so that they have a second life Although that's changed a little bit in recent years and the, and the company that he worked for was creating programs and selling new programs as well as old stuff. Um, and that's where they made their big money. But uh, anyway, yes, I moved around quite a bit. Did you get to experience any of your dad's kind of occupation from the point of as a kid, your dad worked in television? Was there any kind of crossover or was it cool for you? Yeah, it was super cool. My dad uh, was very well known uh, and worked a long time at WBBM in Chicago. Bill Curtis, who's who now is the host of a super famous like podcast and radio broadcast show, uh, was the anchor there, and you know got to go down and see the news get cast and meet him and the weatherman and uh, and all this kind of stuff. And you know, this that, that's kind of like a big deal when you're a kid. Those things seem a little bit larger than life. And later, when my dad worked in syndication, he he worked for 20th Century Fox. And um, at one point we went to LA probably to visit my uncle, his brother. And because my dad worked for 20th Century Fox, he got me onto the set of MASH so I could watch them tape an episode, which was really cool. Did that kind of break down boundaries of like what you'd seen on TV than actually seeing it in real life? Like, oh shit, that's how they do that. Yeah, I mean, it, it looked really, uh, it looked incredibly fake. <laughs> you know, like it just didn't look convincing at all in person. And that that's really interesting. I didn't really take that into account. And what's weird is that now I've seen that MASH episode uh, a couple of times. So there, it's a thing where there's a nurse from Sweden and there's the whole scene that I was watching is her and Alan Alda's character awkwardly kind of tried dancing and he's not very good or something like this. Uh, that That's the whole premise of the, of the scene that I was watching. And now... I haven't seen that episode in many years, but a couple of times it came up in television later and, and it looks fake. Like the whole rest of the show <laughs> looks convincing, but then the thing that I saw from the other side looks unconvincing. I can see things that I saw from the inside perspective and, and you, suddenly it looks like a set and actors trying stuff out where of course the whole show is that it's a set and actors doing things and trying things out, but that, but it looks convincing otherwise. And the same thing as I, um, I taped a, um, a movie called Georgia. Basically, it's about this these two sisters, one played by Mayor Winningham and one played by Jennifer Jason Leigh, both musicians, and, and they have kind of different approaches to life, which reflects in their relationship and in the music that they play. And there's this concert thing that happens where I'm part of Mayor Winningham's band. Um, and so we taped that in a in a an arena in, in Seattle with maybe like a thousand extras, you know, where they, they, you know, they do a contest on the radio or something like this. So this is really weird. So what they, <laughs> the idea was, and what they got the extras to do is the, the applause of the crowd is something they add after the fact. So everybody does this, they clap their hand. You, well, you can see, but everybody else can't, but I'm clapping my hands, but not touching. I'm just flapping my hands near them. So everybody has to do that and look like they're really into it, but not make any noise. That's very strange. But I've seen the um, the film since, and it's just completely, like, it looks fake. I know that if I had not been there for the taping, it would look normal, but it looks fake. But the fact is, all movies are, quote unquote, fake. It's just that your brain puts it all together and kind of fills in the blanks. But if I've seen it being made, that suspension is destroyed. My brain cannot fill in the blanks. It will not fill in the blanks. It just says, no, this is what happened. It was people pretending to clap and people lip sync. It's probably the best lip sync that I've ever seen. It is unbelievable. The scene that Jennifer Jason Leigh does, her thing was to play back, like music coming through the monitors and she just lip synced her performance. And it's a performance in the film where she kind of, she kind of goes off the rails and she, she's like, you know, she's kind of almost at the Janis Joplin level of drugged out alcoholic shambles, shall we say. 
And so she stumbles around the stage and, and, and does all this crazy stuff. And I, she did it in, I think, really, I think she did one take of this. And, and it, it's pretty incredible because it looks like she's just a mess and she's barely hanging on and blah, 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 blah. But to be honest, you know, she's such a good actor that, I mean, she knew exactly every block, every place that she was supposed to stumble and move to on a certain cue for an unbroken take of like a, you know, three minute performance. It's really crazy. The the thing that we did with um, Mary Winningham was live, kind of an acoustic tune with Stephen Souls, who has played on a bunch of stuff and produced a bunch of stuff in the 70s and 80s, especially. That's really nice, except it's not as cinematically interesting. So we basically start to play the tune. We get it like a few bars into it and then cut to scene. When was this shot? Oh, geez, a long time ago. 92, 90, something like that. Yeah. Something like that is it quite a while ago. The husband <laughs> in the film of Mary Winningham is uh, the guy who played, you know, Jamie Gum or Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs, the serial killer. So that'd be around the similar time as that, wouldn't it? Like early 90s. Yeah, that film came out in 1991. Uh, so this was ju- he was already known to be have played that part. With all the moving around, with settling into new schools, did that bother you at all? It was super difficult. And, and of course, as we know, like, you know, kids... Never um, take anything into account like that of going, oh, this is so difficult. They, uh, you know, we're kind of wired to to adapt in a sense or try to adapt um, without complaint. You know, whereas adults, if we don't like something, we, we change the circumstances. You know, I hate this job. I'm going to quit it. I mean, it's not always true, but, uh, you know, kids just go, oh, okay, this uh, job, if you put that a kid in that job, they would just try and do the job forever kind of thing. You know, there, you know, your relationship with that kind of, not even authority, but just circumstances is, you know, you're, you're used to the idea that you're basically kind of something that the parents move around like a piece of furniture in a sense, and you got to just deal with it. So yeah, it was hard. And I, I had like serious kind of, um, I had like communication issues um, as a young person that, Part of it was, you know, being a new kid in school and kind of being on the defensive. It was never like good version of the new kid in school. It was never like, uh, you know, coming in where you feel like you're kind of, I don't know, uh, like special in that sense of like, oh, yeah, I'm coming from some cool place and I'm going to take over this town or something like this is not how I felt. Yeah. Some people say that they can't they can kind of reinvent themselves. I spoke to other people who've like moved to schools a lot and they saw it as an opportunity to kind of reinvent themselves each time. Yeah, I think I was playing catch up always. And I was always younger than everyone in my class. You know, I started school early. So I was always a year behind physically, which does make a difference. You know, difference in height in one year of any of kids is pretty radical. And just in general, um, I was always like a little bit, you know, I was always a kind of shy and withdrawn bookworm kind of person. And I just didn't have that scrappy kid energy that a lot of young kids have. And so that made it harder. I was kind of just perfectly designed by nature to be an outcast. And I took to it all too well. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. Did you latch on to other outcasts? Uh, it was difficult. You know, over the course of my stay in a particular school, I could usually eke out a friend or two. And it was pretty, it was, it was tough. I won't, I won't lie. And I think the only thing that really got me, I mean, I had music as a refuge from a very early age. You know, the incomprehensibility of my fellow classmates uh, was terrifying to me, especially when I first started school. And all the more curious is that and maybe this is projection, but it seemed to me that when I played records, my parents' records, you know, starting at the age of four when I started school, that those people made sense to me. When I put on a record, like, I was like, oh, I understand where this is going. And, and there was an emotional language I was picking up on, it seems, it seemed to me that um, was clear in a way that that other children who are just very chaotic, you know, and et cetera, were not. The only, the only thing that, that did change, I think, is I have to say when we when my parents split, which was pretty, their, their method for handling it was to keep everything out of sight. So it was just, you know, one day my mom coming by my room and saying like, oh, yes, well, I'm going to the grocery store. So I'm going to be gone for a couple hours. Also, uh, your father and I are getting divorced and we're moving to a new town. And uh, then later today, I've got a meeting with them. They're like, what? What did you say? My mom tried to kind of sneak it in there. And it's just like no discussion, shall we say. It's just, and then we just moved to a whole new town with a whole new vibe once again. But I have to say that what saved me in that first year is my last year of elementary school when we showed up in Bellingham, Washington, uh, is I 
had a really good teacher, like really good. He's a young guy and just, you know, hadn't completely been burned out by the the school system yet. Uh, so he's enthusiastic and he cared. So, you know, it didn't take him long to figure out that I was different and that after a couple of, you know, few weeks of being in class, he took me aside and he said, look, you're like years ahead of what I'm teaching. Like you're not in fifth grade. What was the subject? Sorry, he was teaching. Oh, it was just, you know, general, is fifth grade is elementary school. So he taught us all day, all subjects, you know, from math to history to English to whatever. So we didn't move from class. That starts in middle school and uh, the next year. So he, he said, you, you, "There's nothing I can teach you that, that you don't already have." So here's your here's your job for the rest of the year. Your job is to turn in creative writing assignments, whatever you want, fiction, poetry, reports. I don't care what what it is. Turn them in on a regular basis. That'll be fine. And so that's what I did. And it was a great year. And it just gave me lots of confidence. Finally, somebody kind of took pity upon me. I think that I, I was in that position all through elementary school of being ahead because I was a really, really avid reader and writer. I, I, I'm a self-taught reader and writer. So, you know, we spent the first years of elementary school learning how to read and write. And I was already there. So it was a slog, you know. So finally, somebody said, hey, maybe this kid should have something else to do. And so that was great. Then came middle school and, and kind of started out that way a little bit, but you don't spend the whole day with one teacher. So they have a little less chance to look in at what you're doing. And then the other, the middle school, that is to say sixth through eighth grade. So, you know, getting in there around age 11, uh, it was the worst. Yeah. Because the, the that year difference of me and my classmates suddenly became comically exaggerated. I mean, we're talking about puberty here and everybody hits it a year before I do. And I was just, you know, I was like a pudgy, nerdy kid. Uh, with a bull haircut and you know and I got glasses and kids are the worst man they're it's ruthless just, yeah it was it was ruthless so I, I had a really really traumatic like bullying experience like very very like it was the same group of kids and it was a daily ritual of beating and humiliation that lasted about a year and it was it was traumatic I mean I have full on like PTSD from this experience and it's so hard like in today's world I'd like to think it's I mean I know kids have got social media now which is another element of badness but I'd like to think at least in a school system it's a little easier for kids to kind of talk to somebody but back then it, it just so tough yeah there, there there's a there's a little bit of structure around bullying and anti-bullying and it, it's policed to some degree I mean kids will always be cruel and whatnot it's a cruel world but like some yeah I mean this this was certainly worth an intervention at a certain point I mean I was like you know just I look like I don't even know what I look like the Seattle Seahawks uniform. I was just different colors of blue and green for like a year. And, you know, my mom just kind of didn't, of course, all bully kids hide it and, and are ashamed. But at a certain point, I mean, like if you look at one of my, my school pictures from seventh grade, I mean, I, I look like, like I have like some kind of cancer or something. I'm just like, I'm brown and green and black all over my arms. It's clear that somebody has just been like wailing on me. And my mom just didn't really think she had her own shit going on post-divorce build up her life and career. And you know, she'd been out of the workforce for many years. And uh, she was, you know, I remember around that time, she was like, she became a realtor in this town of Bellingham, where it, which was, you know, fully in a recession. So she spent a year like basically not doing anything and that was a big bummer um you know she did she married my stepdad and that was a good thing he had a good gig and then my mom got a good gig and all was well but i think just think my mom was somewhere else mentally and was not on the case probably like thinking oh Ken will tell me if there's a problem. She's probably using that kind of logic. Indeed. And I'm sure it's possible that she even maybe tentatively inquired a little bit, is everything okay? And of course, I'm going to say yes, because it's a shame. I just, you know, all, all the things and, I, you know, of course, my mom did many things, wonderful things, uh, and all parents fail. There's no way that any parent has gone through the process of parenthood without missing something. There's too many factors. You're going to mess something up. But I will say that, you know, there was only one of me. I don't have any brothers and sisters it's pretty easy to keep track of me and now watching the way we have been much more hands-on with our daughter who's also an only child it's just such a different vibe mm -hmm. you know like my wife especially has a, a level of scrutiny on on Aiden our daughter's life
life, that's pretty intense. And Aiden, of course, hates it, but she's considered and she's, you know, she's seen and being seen is like this thing that, that we as humans need. This is why social media has, has worked its magic. The idea that you're seen is a huge thing for us. Where did that come from? I don't know. As a kind of a result of this, was music, did music become even more important to you as like an escapism? For sure. Um, not only just the idea of the safe haven of listening to music and you find kindred spirits in music just by listening to records. You're like, wow, there's somebody who feels my pain to some degree or feels a pain like mine or, or has dreams like mine or whatever. You feel like they are encapsulating exactly what you're going through, despite the fact that you've never encountered them and they have no idea that you exist, but you you feel a kinship with things happening in there, a, sensi- a certain level of sensitivity. And this town, Bellingham, Washington, um, has many lovely things about it. It's certainly grown now and it's quite a desirable place to live. But I would say in early 1980s, post-recession and the Northwest was kind of a backwater. None of the economic success had come to the Northwest that was going to come with the tech waves that came with Amazon and Microsoft, um, which has affected the whole region. But anyway, uh, that wasn't there yet. And I would say the town was was somewhat in a recession. It was a dying mill town, basically. And it had, um, yeah, if you've ever seen this film, The River's Edge, it had that kind of vibe, you know, just like a lot of lost and angry kids who, you know, I mean, there was a certain level of delinquency like in any town, but I don't know, people just had that, that edge, that frustration and I'm sure there was a, a class element in the bullying as well. I mean, you know, I definitely lived on the posh side of town, but I don't know. I mean, it wasn't expressed as thus, but yeah, we can imagine th- those lines in there. But uh, anyway, uh, in, in sixth grade, uh, luckily before really the bullying thing had really started, um, I made a good friend. You know, we had an interest in the same kinds of music and he was already playing music quite a bit. I'd taken piano lessons, so I I knew a little bit. And um, uh, around the time I met him, I had uh, discovered guitar. My stepdad had arrived into our life with a guitar. Uh, He didn't play, but it just kind of ended up in his care. And I was like, hey, there's a guitar in this closet. So I, you know, taught myself how to play guitar. Well, this friend and I started playing music together and and we formed a band even as early as as sixth grade. Um, So that was kind of in place as a, as a place to, you know, at least I had an ally. I mean, he wasn't around for the bullying thing. There's only so many ways I could get home from school. I lived very close to my school and there's only two paths that I could follow to get home. And so it was easy to find me isolated and, you know, whatever, do your thing. You said you was attracted to your parents' music. What kind of stuff was that? Was the kind of a transition from going from their music to finding your own identity through music? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, what they had in their record collection, there was classical music. There was some... Yeah, the more popular end of the jazz spectrum, like, uh, like Dave Brubeck, you know, I truly love. Um, but I mean, they didn't have like heavy stuff like Miles or something like they didn't have any like hard bop or anything like that. More of the, the more approachable end. My mom had a couple rock records in there, a couple Beatles records, Beach Boys record. My dad was really into um, kind of the crooner age, um, you know, Sinatra and Nat King Cole. Those things I love as well. Uh, a little bit of the light end of the rock spectrum. I mean, I think the most contemporary music that we had was probably the Carpenters. Also great. Songwriting masterclass. You know, I love all those things. Yeah. Well, yeah, they they harvested from the best of the best. And the players on those records are incredible too. So yeah, really, really uh, good stuff. Uh, Luckily, the Beatles records were in there to kind of get me into something that had a little bit of an edge. I mean, my mom had a copy of Revolver, which is a pretty edgy record. But yeah, it wasn't until we moved to Bellingham that I started buying records on my own. I was, you know, I was turning 10. So it's about about time I could save up my lunch money. This is pre-MTV, 1978. So I listened to AM radio at first, and that was still pretty good. And I just, I was really into the hits of the day at that age, you know, 10, 11, which would be like pretty quality stuff like ELO and ABBA and the Bee Gees, you know, all amazing in terms of songwriting and production and et cetera. So these were were great records. Then I started kind of going through at a certain point, like especially with my bandmate, Chip, we, you know, kind of went through like the Beatles catalog in order, like getting the records and listening to them and the Stones and the Who. Um, Actually, my stepdad, even so that he's quite a bit older than than my mom, you know, my stepdad was born in the 1920s. He had a 
a couple of Who albums. His son, you know, uh, had turned him on to the Who. And by virtue of the fact that they'd made a quote unquote opera, my stepdad thought that was a pretty cool thing and liked Tommy and Quadrophenia. And so he had those two records. And that was kind of a neat addition to have. I got really into the Who. And then I switched over to FM radio at a certain point, probably in middle school. And that got me into stuff. Zeppelin, uh, The Doors, you know, still old school in a sense. But what you have to understand is that's all the radio played. I mean, as far as contemporary stuff that was cool, it was a rare moment. The Clash, I have to give them credit as a band that broke through. And, you know, even before uh, Combat Rock, um, London Calling got play on, on quite a bit of radio. And that's a pretty interesting band. I got Combat Rock when it came out. And of course, you know, Should I Stay or Should I Go is a very simple, almost a throwaway tune. But there's some definitely some really out there things going on in that record. And I really, really loved that album. You know, I'd never heard anything like it. Where was you buying records from? Did you have a local record store? We had a few, actually, in this little town. There was, first one was like downtown, and it was small and dark. I can't remember what that one was called, but... You know, we're talking, I started going there like, and I bought like, you know, the soundtrack to The Hobbit. That's how early I was going to this record store and contemporary records kind of buying a few different places. But it didn't take long to discover there was a shop called Cellophane Square that um, mixed like used and new records. And and that was a great thing. And so that was like a a real paradise. And especially, of course, in, in high school, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I really started going out. But in middle school, you know, we're in that age where you could still buy like original pressing Beatles albums for not too much money. Um, so, you know, like you flip through and you'd occasionally find like, you know, a, an Apple version of those records or the black label version of the Capital ones. They were on Capital in the States. So yeah, so th- those were cool. And you could find the singles, those wonderful orange and yellow Capital Records singles that, you know, your Beach Boys and Beatles singles were on. Those were cool. So how soon after did you and John meet up? Because you've both been friends since your early teens. Yeah, so this band that I had in, in junior high and middle school, we played a couple times. We mostly played covers. You know, we, we played at our eighth grade bake sale and, you know, we, there were not a lot of options. What kind of bands was you trying to emulate? Yeah, Beatles and the Stones, you know, and the Who. But uh, we also played contemporary covers. We got the gig to play our eighth grade dance. And so uh, we, you know, we learned some covers you know, like uh, Centerfold by the Jay Giles Band, stuff like that. So there, that was kind of our thing. Was you just playing guitar or was you doing any singing at that point? Yeah, definitely singing. And I started out playing keyboards. You know, it was early enough that I just started to play guitar when I when I met Chip, but I'd been taking piano lessons. So I, I can't say that I was a brilliant keyboard player, but I did my best. And then, of course, guitar was just much more practical for a number of reasons. <laughs> um, and so I switched over to guitar as I got a little bit better. And there's just more, there's more rock that you can do with two guitars. I don't know. It, it's kind of a, a classic formula, shall we say. Anyway, so this people came and went in this band. Um, but Chip and I, who are friends to this day, uh, stayed pals. And then, you know, then came high school. So he and I and the drummer, Dean, I'm sure there was a bass player involved, but I just can't remember which one it was was at that point but you have quite a history of bass players <laughs> yes well this is how how it goes we uh we were still notionally we're, we're playing together you know we get together at the drummer's house and play and jam in the garage whatever no no real ambition and there's no gigs and you know we're starting high school so school's a little bit more challenging etc well this is when we met john so we're all freshmen in high school and i was you know i was 13 for most well you know i was 13 starting high school and a little bit behind as always uh but by the time the the school year rolled around later i was 14 and we had heard about this kid who'd moved to Bellingham, who was supposed to be this incredible guitar player, like word went around the whole town about this prodigy. So the thing to do uh, back in those days was after school, you go downtown um, and you hang out, you like basically loiter. <laughs> uh, you go to record stores, uh, you go to the guitar store, kind of make the rounds as, as it were. So Chip, my friend and myself were going by one of the guitar stores downtown and we heard this, you know, blazing lead guitar and looked inside and there was this, you know, kid, I mean, with a, you know, bowl haircut, like really young, blazing away, playing, you know, note for note, like Van Halen and like really like incredible stuff. I've never seen anything like it. And we said, well, that has to be the guy, you know, that's this kid that everyone's talking about. And um, right then and there, Chip said, okay, he's going to join our band. I'm, let me go talk to him. And sure. I mean, he joined our band. It was a good sales pitch from, from Chip. What did joining our band mean? 
it means we got together a couple times in the garage and jammed a little bit. But it was clear from that those first meetings that in terms of ambition or or just worldview that John and I had a lot in common. You know, Chip, God bless him. You know, um, and I'm sure he would be the first to agree. Uh, was always you know talking about you know like kind of like getting famous and you know you want to have like a hot car and you want to like you know impress the ladies to some degree or whatever. He had all these like kind of material. He was a good musician and he loved music, but he also couldn't help but work these kind of material aspirations into it. And John and I would just kind of look at those conversations and kind of like, yeah, (laughs) no, sure, but we're here to play music. That's perhaps not going to help down the line as well when things get really, if you are taking it serious, there's obviously going to be some real down times where you're making zero money, really struggling where if you've got ambitions of fame and money, that's even perhaps going to seem even further away when it gets into the real down and dirty element of it. Yeah, it depend, depending on how hungry you are. I mean, some people have, you know, like they'll do it at any cost, you know, the, the Madonnas of the world, you know, whatever. I mean, like there's that attitude or like the Gallagher brothers or something like this, you know, like they will accept nothing less. Fair enough. That's great for them. For you guys, it was just the creativity and the enjoyment of creating music and making it as good as you could. Yeah, that's the thing is we're, we're already okay. That's the whole thing. I mean, we, fame is nice to some degree. As we've discussed, it can be kind of fun. And certainly the success kind of could give you a certain stability and longevity that takes the doubt away from your future. Um, you know, in, in every kind of creative class, you know, uh, career is full of uncertainties. Just like any corporate career is full of uncertainties, you can always be fired. But while you're not fired, there's this steady paycheck thing that makes the the a job job quite appealing in certain ways. But you know, the the for for the creative mind, for I guess like my notion of safety has always you know, has different criteria than other people's notions of safety. Basically, if I'm not being actively hunted and killed, um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm cool, you know. <laughs> Did you guys connect on any other similar interests, such as films or books or anything like that? You say you're an avid book reader. Well, yeah, but we didn't really have time. Like I said, it was just a couple of jam sessions. When we met each other's eyes during rehearsals, it's clear we we're going like, we're not in the same trajectory as the others. You know, the drummer, uh, Dean, is a really nice guy, but he was just there for fun, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, music should also be fun, but he, you know, I don't think he was like seriously looking ahead. And somehow John and I just knew we were looking to a different horizon than everyone else. I I don't know how we knew that about each other, but we just did. So at this time, you know, now I'm 14, he's 13. He's still in middle school and I'm in high school. So that was it. When, when the, when we weren't jamming, we weren't seeing each other. We weren't pals yet. But then the next year, you know, now I'm in my sophomore year of high school and John comes to my school as a freshman, you know, we had the foundation of a friendship and then you know since we were at school every day then we could actually be friends and be pals and then we could you know discover all the things and yeah so we i would say i wouldn't i wouldn't say john has ever struck me as an avid reader that's not really his thing but um he was definitely a film buff even then and he definitely of course remember everything that we're talking about is pre-internet there's no google search zero like all you can do is maybe read about something in a magazine maybe find that same record or film somewhere available in a video rental shop or in your record store or whatever. But there's just no certainty in this whole thing. And no, it took a lot longer to connect all the dots and kind of explore. It was a much slower process. But anyway, you know, like I would have to give credit for John for bringing to me all kinds of pretty exotic films and heavy stuff, you know, lots of weird experimental films and foreign art films. Even at that age, like your early teens. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That, so that was cool. And I, you know, continued to, of course, as music and film kind of came into my life at that point, I wasn't as heavy a reader as I had been when I had no friends, but I still took on heavy stuff when I could. Um, but yeah, we were just kind of going and, and and musically, I mean, so John came with an enormous amount of talent and interest. He came with a dad who who was a musician. So they so he had daily dialogue and practice in the understanding of how to. I mean, you know, my mom was trying to kind of corral my, my musicality as best she could, but not being a musician herself, it was kind of guesswork for her. 
whereas John's dad, you know, he was a college professor, not in music, but he was an avid musician and had been very involved in the folk music scene in Bellingham. He could guide John in a way that was a little more effective, shall we say, um, and a little more hip. Uh, and they could, you know, they could discuss records together. And what. so John had that whole language for music that was, that was really cool. And as if that wasn't enough, he and his dad had put together a studio in their house, just not something that everybody had. So once again, we have to put this in the context of the times, whereas today you have pretty much, if you want it, almost universal access to making music with software and hardware. It's a wonderful thing. I would never go back. I think it's great. And YouTube to tell you exactly how to do it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, and all this instruction. Yeah. So back then, like nobody had a home studio. I mean, that's just absurd. Um, it, you know, you needed a tape machine, you need to know how to run it and take care of it. Not that this wasn't like a giant, uh, like 24 track or some kind of professional, you know, it was an eight channel uh, reel to reel tape machine. And that was plenty to get the job done. So, you know, we had that as our playground for all through high school. So was that your first recording experience as well? I would imagine it was at that kind of age. Almost. Okay. Almost. Um, It was simultaneous to, I had another band in high school called the Genetic Defects. It was weird. Like we did like pretty experimental, bizarre music. And of course we did most of our recording, like we'd play into a cassette machine, a whole bunch of musicians playing at once with a little bit of mixing on the way in and then ping pong that through a mixer to another cassette machine. And we'd play more stuff on top of that. And we made some pretty strange yet somewhat sophisticated recordings with this method. And at the same time, we also played gigs and in those gigs to, you know, to flesh out the evening and to, you know, I mean, some of the stuff we were playing was so weird that it wasn't really going to fly at a party kind of thing. So we did learn some covers. It's no Jay Giles band. No, sure not. <laughs> um, and so we went to this, um, there's a guy named John Memolo in, in Bellingham. He's still doing m- music there. And uh, it's kind of interesting. He's like one of those guys that was totally like, like he looked like kind of like Rudy Sarzo or something like that. You know, he, he had that mo- kind of Motley Crue hair and he's, you know, he's like a kind of a metal dude back in those days, but he's kind of become like really like a Beatles-esque like power pop guy and he's just kind of you know his motley crew hair just kind of stayed the same and just kind of condensed into like ramon's hair brilliant cool right like he's he, he, he's a he's a cool guy but he was really the first guy that actually went to something called a studio and what it was was just like he had a um he had a, like a, a room in his house that you could set up and play in very small and then next to that another little tiny room and there's just a four track on a table he could run some mics up but he recorded us in like 1984 and it's really around the same time that I started going to John's house and playing at his place with this other band. <laughs> so we had another band with uh, that the famous Chip, my friend from middle school, was in with John, and uh, that I joined eventually as a keyboard player. Um, and it and this band was incredible. So this band was called The Process, and it's absolutely like Journey or or, or something like that AOR stuff. You know, you know the the musical interlude in Boogie Nights? It's that band essentially without the drugs, you know, making 80s power rock basically. Um, pretty good actually for what it was. Has any of that ever survived? Oh, well, yeah, there's for sure there's tapes of it. Yeah, absolutely. So we did stuff at, at John's house with this band and we even at a certain point, you know, because it was you know, it was quite commercial what we were doing. Our parents kind of teamed up and financed us to go to Vancouver. There's a local guy, well, he, I mean, he's actually from Britain, a guy named Julian Smedley, if you can believe that, who's an absolutely cracking jazz violinist, great musician, really nice guy. And he was living in Bellingham and he had some studio experience and he signed on to produce this stuff. And we went to uh, Mushroom Studios in Vancouver. And that's, that's a big time studio. It's, you know, Heart and Loverboy, did all a lot of their classic stuff. And how old are you at this time? Oh, like 15. And and uh, we worked with Keith Stein, who, who you know, recorded Loverboy, you know, and, and did this serious recording. And Julian mixed it at Fantasy in San Francisco, which is like, you know, this mega studio where like all kinds of crazy stuff has been done. Whatever, whatever big stuff has been done in the Bay Area, Fantasy at one point had a hand in it. Anyway, so we, we did that. It didn't go anywhere, um, but it, it, it was a pretty intense experience to go to a real studio and, and have that under your belt. How many songs did you do? Three or four. And then, you know, we, we, then on top of that, we had John's 
studio to just screw around in whenever we want, whether it's within the context of one of these bands or just John and I just having fun making shit up in the studio and just trying different styles. And John was a, a really good sequencer and drum machine programmer. He was really got into that whole synth thing. And he was, you know, that, that idea of, of step programming into a drum machine, which is quite abstract in a sense you have to kind of think linearly through the whole thing it's it's somewhat counterintuitive to the way we play music you have to just like build something out ahead of you or whatever did all that stuff just kind of come natural to him yeah he, he was just a, a, like a whiz and he'd become a really good engineer i mean you know uh, certainly had mastered everything you need to know about that eight channel studio and when we started to get fast forward a few years when now we had our band and we were doing stuff he had no fear about going in and and doing stuff in a, in a major studio and getting completely hands-on. I mean, he applied all those principles, which you can apply to, uh, you know, any studio in the world. And what's interesting about John is that uh, he came out of the gate as this total prodigy. And as I mentioned, I mean, just off the charts, guitar playing, um, you know, really as good as anyone else you can think of. Did that ever intimidate you or was that kind of a nice comfort for you? Oh yeah, it was great to have. You know, I, I had to find my niche. You know, I mean, I was, I was a pretty good singer. That this thing, and I'd gotten a lot of confidence. I'd been doing, John and I were both in the choir in school and not only the concert choir, which was kind of open to all. And it was a class that you took during the day, but there's also the jazz choir, which you had to audition for and which was something that, that met outside of school hours. You know, we both nailed that. And the teacher was great teacher, Mr. Matson. Mr. Dale Matson. He was a fantastic teacher. And, you know, there's a lot of musicality involved if you wanted to get into it, you know, like in terms of sight reading and whatnot. I mean, you could coast through the concert choir and not really take it that deeply if you wanted to. And some people saw it as a quote unquote easy elective. You know, it's a big choir. So like you can kind of sneak in there. But if you wanted to take advantage of the situation and, and learn, there was plenty to learn. And, and, and uh, the choir teacher, Mr. Matson, was a really good teacher. He taught me everything you need to know about singing technique, uh, which is why, you know, touch wood to this day, you know, at age 52, that I can go out there and sing as hard and as long as you can imagine for two hours in my solo show with no microphone or whatever. And, you know, touch wood, really never have any issues voice wise. You went to university after high school, though. Yes, I was definitely treading water. Yeah, I was definitely treading water at university. I, uh, I really did not have a game plan. As you can imagine, I mean, like all through high school, I mean, like music was an obvious thing. It just never occurred to me that that was a thing that you could pursue in a legitimate sense. And, and, and I, you know, my mom was, was there to basically manage the project of raising me is where my, you know, my dad lived very far away, time zones away. So my mom was, had custody. I, I only lived with my mom. I'd visit my dad, but, and my stepdad, you know, was there for me too. Uh, but, you know, moms are in charge. Typically they're the decision makers. They take the responsibility and it was her kid. So, you know, she was, she just wanted me to get into college and at any cost, which is fine. And I did very well in school. I tested very well, all that kind of stuff. I just didn't, you know, I got accepted to some really nice schools. I just didn't want to live in, for example, St. Louis. It just didn't strike me as interesting. Uh, Washington University is a fantastic school, you know, excellent school for journalism, blah, 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 blah. I just didn't want to go to St. Louis. You know, I was interested in going to Seattle. Now, just remember everybody that this is 1986, 1985, 86, where I'm selecting colleges. I graduated high school in the spring of 1986. Seattle that I'm talking about has nothing to do with the Seattle that you know. There was no uh, music scene that, that people knew about. I mean, there was bubbling under, but basically Seattle, Seattle it would be comparable to something like Portland, Maine or something like that. A charming small city. With good coffee. Uh, well, I mean, that was still in the future too. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, there, was a, there was a Starbucks... The original Starbucks started when I was in high school, um, but it was just the one down in the Pike Place Market. None of that existed yet. That's how long ago we're talking about. <laughs> the seeds were sown. I mean, Microsoft existed as a company, but it hadn't become a ubiquitous world power yet. It was just starting. Starbucks, like I said, was one store. They hadn't started their real expansion yet, et cetera, et cetera. And the music scene, you know, none of the bands that you know existed except Soundgarden. And Soundgarden was not the Soundgarden that you know. Soundgarden was more, a bit more like the cult, I would say, would be the closest to the comparison to the early Soundgarden vibe. Not that there's anything wrong with that. They hadn't found their own voice yet, shall we say. 
anyway, so that, but I just, but Seattle was the big city for us living in Bellingham. It's 90 miles south of us and it was the place to go. So I just wanted to go to Seattle. And so I went to the University of Washington, which is not a bad school, but, but not, not as elite or as probably stimulating as schools I could have gone to and was accepted to. But I wanted to go to Seattle. And my mom was, of course, a little bit disappointed with my choice. Uh, and I didn't have a game plan. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was hoping that it would become apparent. But what became apparent while I was there at the University of Washington was that uh, I was a little bit lost. I took kind of random this and that. Uh, I did pretty good. I mean, I still was acing classes and whatnot when the profs were good. And, you know, all the cliches, sometimes you have a class where it's done in a lecture hall and there's like 200 people in there and that kind of thing just didn't, I didn't really get it. I mean, it was different. I should have figured it out, but I, it was so different from what I knew. It, it didn't seem... I didn't know how to really work with it that well. Um, I certainly wasn't on point to find a, a major, as we say, and declare it and do something. I was definitely foundering, as it were. You're still going back and forth with John at this time. For that first part of university. So basically, John and I had been pretty much inseparable in that last year of high school and doing all kinds of musical projects together. And we were in those two choirs together and, 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 and. And we were, you know, having parties and, and whatever, you know, just we just were, were buds. And I think we reached a little bit of a saturation point by the time I graduated. You know, John was still one year away from graduating. And anyway, I went to Seattle and I just was thrown into the big city and university and all this stuff. And I just, just to get some, my feet on the ground and get some traction, I didn't really look back to any of the relationships from high school. I just was kind of getting into this whole new thing. It was frankly, completely overwhelmed. So it was a while. It wasn't until I'd written some songs living there in the dorms uh, at the University of Washington. So, you know, after the first semester, so we've gone through Christmas break, etc. I probably saw John over the Christmas break, probably went home, but um, it was the beginning of 1987. So somewhere a third into that first year of university that uh, I demoed some songs. And then I felt like I had something interesting to share with John. Um, these are songs, some of which ended up on our first album and he'd of course been doing the same he had a studio of course he was demoing songs and and we found that i don't know just something had um had changed in terms of what we were the kind of stylistically and quality wise we felt like something had kind of gone up a notch what were you listening to at this time as a fan i was listening to uh the replacements quite a bit um Husker du, which you know i started my love for Husker du in high school but they actually came to my university and played on their last tour while I was there. And that was like insane. I was very into REM, you know, and uh, REM also came to not my college, but they came to Seattle. You know, now I was in the big city, so I had access to shows. It was much more challenging uh, when I was in high school to get to Seattle for a show. Uh, you know, it was an hour and a half drive and somebody needed to have a car, permission, blah, blah, blah. But here, I, you know, there's shows all the time, you know, bigger stuff and stuff at the university. Uh, I was listening to, yeah, you know, whatever, New Order, Bauhaus, Love and Rockets, and stuff that I still loved from the high school years. This was kind of the beginning. Um, I was a big fan of Squeeze and right around this time, they had a hit in the States. They broke through. They had a hit that was on MTV and the radio. And that was cool. They came to town and I saw them play. And yeah, just, you know, like stuff like that. The Smithereens, I really loved. And yes, that's that's a good comprehensive list there. Robin Hitchcock uh, was a big one for me. Firehose, but you know, some of the other SST bands I loved. Very cool. So kind of the whole poses dynamic with John, was it all just kind of organic and just built up? Or did the two of you kind of sit down and say, right, let's focus on this as much as we can? Yeah, I, I think it's really the latter uh, in, in a sense. I mean, musically, I think we'd arrived at something. The thing that united these diverse, you know, something as diverse as Husker Du, New Order, Squeeze, Elvis Costello, and The Replacements, and blah, blah, blah. Like, on the surface, those bands are quite different. But if you examine them up close, there's a, just a certain level of song craft that goes into each one. I, I know that seems a little bit... that You're going to kind of maybe push back on me on, on New Order, whose songs are kind of based on technology in a sense, but melodically, uh, they have excellent composition. I mean, you can play a New Order song without drum machines and synths. You could, uh, Age of Consent or something like that. So we just kind of realized there's a structural uh, compositional thread that kind of wove its way through all the music we liked throughout the ages and that certain songs could exist without 
shall we say, contemporary production as the tipping point. You didn't need a gimmick. A good song could exist on its own. And, and what was interesting is we saw also these bands like The Replacements and Husker Du are, are great examples that started out as, you know, seemingly kind of nihilistic, anarchistic punk bands with, you know, not caring about anything, you know, like live for the moment and making this kind of radically destructive music. They kept coalescing into songwriters like that was the only place left for them to go what they discovered intuitively and what what i was seeing was that structure and composition endures and those kind of things are powerful it's powerful to have a message that keeps transmitting itself even at long after you're dead and and it's not that we wanted immortality we just saw that it was powerful it, it kept having meaning um, it, structure gives context that gives meaning this is kind of a little bit what we saw so that that's what we want what we wanted to do so when you set out to record the album fail you it was effectively just the two of you yeah how was that did you have a clear idea of where you wanted it to sound full band yeah well we did i mean and and the the whole point of the recording uh was that you know trying to explain kind of the concept about our songs you need like a 30 second pitch for something right like if when we're talking to people who who might want to join a musical project with us and we start explaining all this abstract stuff i mean their eyes would glaze over (laughs) in like 10 seconds and they'd be like i you know i just want to rock or (laughs) I, i think that what we were kind of proposing seemed also against the current climate like where you know we were seeing we were like looking ahead right so all the songwriters and bands and stuff that we loved were like kind of getting more focused in a sense on songwriting but the people that we were encountering were still back a few years so they were still more in the like let's break down the walls man and you know i mean you have to understand that like there were places in in 1986 where i was not where i lived in seattle but there are places in america where like even the music of 1977 the sex pistols and the damned and all that hadn't yet reached it was still getting to certain parts of America. So that's, you know, I mean, Seattle is more hip than that, but this is kind of where we're at. Like people are still like, you know, I mean, I went to high school with people who were, you know, still doing the like spiked leather jackets and mohawks and stuff like that. And, you know, there's just a little bit, that's like already old in Britain. Like people have been doing that starting in like 1975, 1976, right? So, you know, like it's, it just takes a long time for those cultural ideas to penetrate. And so we were like, even in Seattle, dealing with people who still thought that the idea was to deconstruct, but deconstruction was already over. The music had already moved forward, just nobody had noticed. And we were looking at being on kind of a, not a cutting edge, but taking that concept a little further. It was really hard to get people to sign on board. So what we decided to do was to record all the songs with all the parts so that we wouldn't have to explain what we were doing they could just listen to it and this is so this is like a demo to get bandmates this is exactly how we conceived this recording we did not think of it as an album we happened to have about 12 songs and we had a couple others that weren't quite finished so we those went on the wayside but in the end we had 12 songs that were finished or ready and so we just recorded them but a radio station picked up right like unsolicited yeah so basically after we made the recording and we played it for a friend or two you know they would say well to me, it sounds like you made a record. I mean, it's got 12 songs and it sounds good. So like, I don't think this is a demo. And we're like, oh, oh, okay. Well, then we'll just put it out. I mean, you know, we still hadn't found any bandmates. So (laughs) yeah, we didn't really know how to get LPs made and CDs were not really that prominent at that point. It seemed logical to us to make cassettes. They were easy. John had already done it. He'd made a couple of cassette compilations with a friend of his of bands that had come through his studio and kind of documented the music scene in our town. So he was well familiar with the concept of getting cassettes made. So we made cassettes and we put them on consignment at record stores. And the cool thing is that, remember I was talking about this used record store in Bellingham. Well, that was the other branch. The original store was in Seattle. And uh, it was in the university area, which is where I lived. And at this store worked Scott McCoy from the band The Young Fresh Fellows, who later ended up being in R.E.M. with me, etc. as the band The Minus Five. He was, you know, just um, a wonderful guy and he was involved in a lot of cool stuff. And I have to say that as a local band, uh, The Young Fresh Fellows, uh, we absolutely adored them, you know, so he was a hero for us. And he worked at the record store and he wrote for the local music paper. This is the guy to know. 
<laughs> this is the guy to know, but I didn't even think of it in those terms, but it's just that that's Scott McCoy. He's our hero. We have to give him one. So I, you know, gave him a cassette when I consigned our cassettes at the record store he made sure that he just could take one. And this is like one day. In one day in the university area of Seattle, we dropped a cassette off at the college radio station. We dropped cassettes on consignment at the used record store and gave one to Scott. And we dropped them off at another radio station, a commercial radio station to totally doing uh, just due diligence. But I mean, we're like two teenagers from Bellingham, Washington, which is really not cool. And you just don't drop things off at a commercial radio station. Maybe if you're really, really lucky, they might do a locals only night on Sunday nights at like 11 and you might get played once and that's it. Do you just drop it at the front desk in a brown envelope? Yeah. Did you have the foresight to have like a press release in there or anything like that? Just a cassette? No, I I, I think we just had like, uh, I mean, I think we had a little tiny little thing that, that, but there's nothing to write about. (laughs) We've never played a game. You couldn't even big yourselves up. We didn't know how. Um, so all the less likely that all this happened. So we're, you know, one day we do all that. And then uh, John goes back up to Bellingham. By this time, you know, it's 1988. And I'm in my second year at the university. And John is attending university in our hometown. And like a week later, I see the, the Rocket, which was our free monthly music paper, came out. And there is a review from Scott in there in his column and it's an absolutely glowing review then i turn on the radio the commercial station which is the one i listened to that you know they were playing music i liked like camper van beethoven and soul asylum bands that were like in the replacements and you know i mean it was a commercial station but it was cool and i turned on the radio like i always did and there was our song and i was like what and then like an hour later it played again and then it played again like it was playing every hour like we went into their top level rotation for no reason other than the guy heard it and liked it. Was the guy getting feedback from listeners to like, oh, we like this, play it again? He soon did, yeah. I mean, you know, it actually, yeah, it went completely viral. I mean, people started freaking out and, you know, we didn't, I mean, we didn't have a band. But then Scott, God bless him, I went by the record store to thank him for the review, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, hey, do you guys want to play a gig? Uh, My wife's band is playing, you know, it's like a Wednesday night at a tavern in in Seattle. And we're like, yeah, 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 sure. No bandmates. (laughs) So I'm like, shit, what are we going to do? So I had had, uh, well, I had this biology class I was taking. I had spoken a little bit with a guy there. He'd admired my 11 Rockets t-shirt. And uh, he'd mentioned that he plays guitar. And then he had a roommate that was a drummer, blah, blah, blah. And he, you know, he might have even said, hey, we should jam sometime or whatever. And I, so I was like, listen, <laughs> you know, I know you got that roommate that's a drummer. And, you know, you can play guitar. It would, do you think you can play bass? I'd played bass on the record, but I was absolutely sure that I couldn't play bass and sing. It seemed like a pretty arduous task considering that record was probably the first time I'd ever played bass in my life. So uh, I was, I didn't think that I had the technique to sing and play bass, but he, you know, I didn't have to explain anything anymore. He was like, my, you know, he's like, yeah, I heard you guys are all over the radio. Like, uh, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, I got this gig and blah, blah, blah. So turns out they lived just a block up the street from me. So I, you know, went up over to their house with John and, and we jammed and it sounded great. And uh, in, you know, 10 days, we put together our set based on the album and a few covers to round it out. And we played uh, this gig. And of course, there's already anticipation about us at this gig where it had gotten around and then people heard us on the radio. People knew the songs to some degree. And then from that point on, it went really mad. We were like trying to make as many cassettes as we could with like several cassette decks. You know, John got a move to Seattle and he got a gig working at a record store down there and he would just take boxes of promo cassettes and bring them home and we'd put, you know, new labels on them, tape over them. Sometimes they were too long, sometimes they were too short. There wasn't another song turned up at the end of it from the previous ones. Sometimes, yeah. And sometimes the last song would just stop halfway through. Uh, Nobody cared. Um, and we started just to get, you know, we we had a P.O. box. We'd gotten clever enough that we'd printed a, a, a mailing a box in the post office on our cassette cover. And we were just getting mail and we were getting letters from like EMI and RCA and all this kind of stuff. And other stations, because no station wants to be left out once there's blood in the water. Then the, the uh, like the big, <laughs> like a top 40 station in Seattle, like we bypassed the rock stations and went straight to KUBE, which is, you know, a CHR station. And they played us. And so they did an event, like we'd been playing for one month. The thing is, I have to put this in context of, in Britain, you have somewhat of a tradition of this kind of thing where people are really eager for the next 
cool band and they can go from in like they've been together for five gigs and they're, you know, playing to 5,000 people and they're on the cover of music magazines. I mean, maybe that era has passed a little bit, but it's not unusual for a very like the Arctic Monkeys and the Stone Roses. I mean, it didn't take them long before they were playing huge venues. Instantly the buzz band. Yeah. This kind of thing in the States, it's too big, you know, and, and our media isn't that powerful. It's too diverse and the, the regional radio and everything. We can't do that in the States. It's never really worked. But in Seattle, we had something like that. I mean, like we maybe played 10 gigs and we were playing a show on a beach sponsored by the top 40 station for like two or 3,000 people. And it was just insane. I mean, it was like total madness. I mean, that, that was a free show, sure, but it gave you an idea of the familiarity. We played a, a free show at when school started in the fall of 1988. And now we've been playing all summer. You know, we played a free show at the university in Bellingham outdoor that usually, you know, is their back to school show. And usually they had a kind of a okay local band and they'd get a few hundred people coming by. And there's like 3000 people showing up for this kind of thing. <laughs> Our page, you know, when we when we did our record release, because we we got picked up by the, the local label Pop Llama in Seattle, and we put the LP out in December. You know, we still were good for like a thousand people paid in Seattle if it was all ages, because our our audience was mostly underage, like we were. This seems to be a lot of instances, particularly in your early career. You and John meeting in an area which you weren't originally from, because you travel around. Your unsolicited album getting on the radio, which is was perhaps unheard of, and also forming a band at a time when there was such a shift in music which took place in Seattle which you guys would eventually kind of become associated with definitely you obviously have to have the talent and drive to have longevity for the career which you've had but are you someone who kind of believes in fate and unusual opportunities like that if I didn't believe in those kind of things I'd have to be a pretty strong resistant because I mean my whole life is like these weird you know unlikely serendipitous kind of things. If that was a currency, you know, I would, I would be Jeff Bezos, you know, like really. It is a kind of currency. It is kind of allowed me to live kind of an incredible life. I'm not even going to say kind of. I've lived this incredible life and done all these amazing things that just, I feel like this could have happened to anybody. I mean, we did work hard. We do have some talent, you know, we can sing, we can play, we can write. I mean, there's a lot of people who work hard and can sing and can play and can write who don't get the same lucky breaks as we do, or we have, shall we say. So I, it's really mystifying. There's so many, I mean, everybody who was on my wall in, you know, my wall of posters in high school is someone I've either joined their band like R.E.M. or I've at least played with them. You know, I've played with John Paul Jones and I've played with Ringo and I've played with John on Whistle and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's just, weird <laughs> that's great i kind of bring things to a close there's a couple of things i just want to touch on the whole rem thing would be a whole new podcast on its own i would imagine but how was that for you being a fan and getting to join them for such a long time and being plugged into that whole massive machine was it everything you hoped it would be well i mean i, I certainly it's not like i entertained a hope of one day being in rem it just seemed completely out of my league. I mean, they're one of my favorite bands, you know, and, and certain records arriving at certain times, you know, like Life's Ritz Pageant, for example, when that record was about to arrive and when it arrived, I mean, that was a big moment for myself and my friends and, you know, just getting into their whole deciphering what their messages could mean and all that stuff. They're just such an intriguing band. Very important band to me in high school. And I dutifully, you know, went to see them when, when they played in 1986 in Seattle on that pageantry tour and, you know, just loved it. So it just, I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> there's no, there's no clear path. It wasn't like, Oh, one day I'm going to play with those guys. It's just, that's <laughs> not how I thought. There's like, they're one of my favorite bands. I love them. And then just life kept putting me closer and closer. Really the key to understanding it all is, is once again, Scott McCoy. I mean, the, the, the man who, who gave us our first review and our first gig and Scott's karma is just, kind of completely untarnished. I mean, he really is a, a, one of, of all the good eggs. Yeah. There are few gooder eggs out there. He's just such a cool guy and um, so kind, you know. So because of his work as a journalist and musician, you know, he'd gotten on, on R.E.M.'s radar. He interviewed them very early on, one of the first shows in Seattle, and had become friends with them, basically. And when he his band, the Young Fresh Fellas, went on tour, they stayed at Peter's house. Peter and Scott are like the same guy, in a sense, except Peter is a little more dark and cynical in a sense and sarcastic. So they're, they're, they have a, that much yin and yang in that sense and that, that, you know, Peter is snarky and Scott is not, is the opposite of snarky, but they fit together. They both have 
the same encyclopedic view of records. These are guys that, that when I knew them in the 90s living in Seattle, each had like 30,000 LPs easily. I mean, an <laughs> insane amount of, of records and could tell you something about any one of them, no problem. So they had that both that uh, encyclopedic kind of vibe. So they were kind of destined to be buds in a sense. And it's just that Seattle became Seattle, which, like I said, it, I didn't go there because Seattle was the hot music scene. It was definitely not the hot music scene when I moved there. Like Minneapolis, maybe. Boston, maybe. But Seattle? Are you kidding me? I mean, Seattle, it'd be like, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on the UK, but it'd be like if Preston became the hottest music scene in, in the country or something like this. Okay. And that's no insult to anybody. It's just the, the last place you'd expect. Which is perhaps what clicks and what makes it so special. Yeah. It gave its individuality for sure. Um, and it was just untapped. It was a rich resource that nobody knew about. There's all this stuff going on that makes Seattle interesting and unique, but it, it just hadn't been, nobody knew about it. It was up there in the corner. Uh, but so because Seattle is Seattle is why REM chose Shirley. Seattle to make an album. They made much of Automatic for the People in Seattle. And, you know, Kurt Cobain had, of course, made it very clear that, you know, R.E.M. was an important band for him and that had led to a friendship between Michael and Kurt. And all of that kind of got R.E.M. to come to Seattle to make a record and Peter never left. So the only real friend good friend that he had in town when they moved, uh, when they came to work there was Scott. And Scott introduced Peter to Stephanie, who owned the music venue where Scott was the booker, the place where the Posies were the very first band to ever play there. And it was like our HQ. And Peter and Stephanie got married. And so Peter just stayed. That led to, you know, Peter cannot go five minutes without creating a project. He's really probably the most restless musical person I've ever met. Uh, and so naturally, like, because I was already playing music with Scott at this point, and that led to Peter and Scott and I play music together. And that's the pathway that got me involved eventually in R.E.M. Was that whole machine get another whole another level? The weird thing is, is I, it didn't feel like a machine. I mean, I would say, I mean, it is a big thing. When, when we toured, you know, we're at that level of playing those big venues where you, you're kind of obliged in a sense to carry all the production, the staging, the PA and whatnot. So there's trucks and there's, there's people that, you know, you might never even meet on the crew, you know, like their job hours are so different from yours and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, of course it's professional and the people doing that job and the, you know, if you're putting together a stage and hanging giant PA things, yes, the people are good at their jobs because if they're not like people will die. <laughs> So yes, everybody was a top level professional and, and whatnot, but it just didn't feel slick. I mean, it just felt like, I mean, I, th I think that it just felt kind of like a, yeah, it's kind of like circus people in a sense, you know, it's like, it's got a traveling family vibe to some degree, not quite as weird as circus people. Sorry, circus <laughs> people, but you have that reputation. Excellent. Ken, thank you ever so much. Good luck with your shows coming up in Spain. Have you had a relationship with the promoters and stuff like that for a long, long time? Well, Spain is just like this place that from day one of the Posies arrival 28 years ago, we just connected with that audience and they've never gotten tired of us. We can play there all the time and, and we have a great audience that's enthusiastic and it's just, just a lot of love between us and audiences in Spain. It, it's We have good relationship with our fans everywhere. But Spain is just at another level. People are just more excited about us there still uh, than just about anywhere else. Um, and that has, you know, spread out to my solo work and stuff like that. So sure, I mean, from touring there all the time, I do have good relationships with things there. And I, you know, I put together this tour myself. In a sense, I'd kind of had a date on hold at this one venue there. And as it was coming up, I was like, so what do you think? I mean, should we not do this or whatever? And they said, actually, right now is a great time. We can do shows, seated, masked, blah, 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 limited capacity, blah, blah, blah. If you're into it, you know, and you can come, come, you know, we'll, we'll have a great time. And thus, I just reached out to a couple other venues I know to make the trip, you know, more than one show. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we can do stuff. And, you know, under the very limited circumstances, I've done these kind of shows a little bit already. There was a window for a while in Germany last year where in September I did a show where it was seated and masked and all that stuff. And it was a great experience. I mean, at this point, playing at all is a great experience. And so, you know, we're going for it. If things change and it's not possible, you know, we're still three weeks away, we'll, you know, postpone it to another time. But if it's possible, I'll do it. You know, the, the reason I can say that, and, and, and I'm trying not to sound callous to all the things that 
that are dangerous and blah, 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 is that I've now done a couple of these shows and they went well. And if people follow the rules, generally they're safe. I mean, nothing is 100% safe that we know, but from the shows I've done so far, nobody's gotten sick, touch wood, and, and, and everybody enjoyed the experience. And it's of course, extremely meaningful because of how difficult it is right now. So if we can do it and it's, as far as I can tell, quite safe, then yes, I, I think it's a good thing to do. In fact, you know, we, we need to keep art and culture in the mix and we should keep trying and keep experimenting and find the ways to make this work because, you know, we need art in our lives. We need music in our lives. Not just me who makes my living from it, but I think everybody yeah. who listens too. And a new Poses album recorded. I know you had the single out uh, in September. In the great tradition of the days of yore, put out a non-album single. <laughs> I was just looking at this that, um, like, for example, Deep Purple's biggest hits in the UK, in fact, it only hits in the UK, uh, Strange Kind of Woman and Black Knight were like not on albums, actually, if I recall correctly. Uh, not until greatest hit things later. But anyway, that was like the thing. There's always like non, there's singles that came out that had nothing to do with the albums. That's how the things worked back in the day. Well, we did that this year and put out something so we could, you know, just kind of remind everyone. Still here. We're thinking about them and we're still here. We do have a record being mixed right now and it's just gone quite slowly, the mixed thing with the communication and everybody kind of off in their own little worlds. But, uh, and also there's just no deadline. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but we are going to get it done. And, and I, I think it's a, you know, I think we've done some really strong work. I think the writing is really good and it's just nice. We, we actually, you know, we recorded it in 2019, generally, most of the stuff in my studio in Seattle. And so it's, it's not one of these things where we've been trading, you know, files through the mail, through the email or whatever. You know, we were for 90% of this record, I would say we were in the same room. So any kind of game plan or just judging it from when the world kind of gets back to normal and try and put it out? Yeah, I think it's really more about like when when we can see the end of the tunnel in mixing, I think then we'll start to start to share it with some labels and go and kind of go from there. Well, I hope that shows are a great success and thank you ever so much for giving us so much of your time and sharing your stories. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, you enjoyed the rest of your day, Ken. Thank you. You too. Thanks so much to my guest Ken Stringfellow for really sharing some amazing stories during our chat. You know you're onto a good talk when close to an hour in you've barely got through half of the things you wanted to ask. Ken was a great sport and I loved hearing all about those early days. Hopefully sometime down the line we can catch up again and learn a little more as I feel we barely scratched the surface. Please be sure to visit at Ken Stringfellow on both Instagram and Twitter to find all the info about his music and his live shows in Spain later this month. And any musicians out there who would be interested in working with Ken can contact him there too. As always, thanks to you guys for tuning in again to the Straight to Video podcast and for all the great support and shares on these chats. This year has got off to a great start, so I hope everything is sounding good and you're having fun listening to the cool people I'm getting the chance to talk to. Can't wait to do it all again, so until next time, look after yourselves and speak soon. <laughs>